Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Peter! Peter. <laughs> okay, good. Yay, we hope that you have a really good day. Uh, we hope that you're turning like five and you don't really know what it's like to miss out on a birthday party. But if you're not five and you're like, you know, a normal adult age, we're really sorry. And we hope that next year um, you'll make up for it. You share a birthday with James Watts, Watson, the uh, oh. man who did some good work, stole some good work. Um, and probably marginalized a few women along the way. Well, certainly he did one, almost like 100% certainly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Who else? Who else shares your oh, birthday? Oh, that's better. Oh. Lando Calrissian. It's Billy D. Williams' birthday today. Lando Calrissian. Yay, that's great. <laughs> cool. And Merle Haggard. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go on. No, you, please uh... don't. We'll get started. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, oh, wait. No. Cliff Clavin. Oh, oh, cheers. John cheers. Ratzenberg. Yeah. John Ratzenberg. That's a good one. To so share many of the voices in, uh, in all the Toy Story movies. Yay. Okay. Good. So I'll stop now, please. Unless I found another one. Yeah. Fill in this table for homework. Um, if you haven't, uh, we will take uh, quite a few questions from it um, for the final exam. So just make sure that you've got it. Um, and in order to see whether or not you've got it, we have a clicker <laughs> question um, that we need Menti for. We'll open up Menti in a second. Um, here we go. We're opening it. We're opening it. Uh, here's the clicker question. Go and take a look. You can get started thinking about it, and we'll give you the Menti code in just a little while if you want to try to um, figure out what the answer is, but we'll give you a couple minutes to read it. Because Smith is typing it. The code is Good. You're doing very well. Okay. Go, 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 go. Good job. Ah. Okay. Super good. So, the answer is, is C. So C is the correct answer. It's the only like totally true statement there. Um, you can see non-adaptive traits can still evolve in the context. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Hold on just one second. Yes, non-adaptive traits can still evolve in the context of environmental facilitation. Remember, it's the environment that's kind of allowing these non-adaptive traits to evolve. And it has important restrictions in the species resilience. Um, with respect to climate change. So because the presence of the non-adaptive trait is facilitated by the environment, as soon as the environment changes, the idea is that that um, trait will 
um, really truly be non-adaptive and may end up um, uh, causing the, the species to go extinct. A few of you did say D as being a true statement. So mutations that cause non-adaptive physiological traits are the result of living in extreme environments. There's no reason to suggest that there would be the evolution of more non-adaptive mutations in an extreme environment compared to a non-extreme environment. Um, so that's not true, uh, where there's natural selection of individuals having traits that increase their productivity. Certainly natural selection um, does describe the process of the selection of individuals that have higher productivity or higher fitness. Um, but, uh, but again, it's really more about this, uh, and it's not quite totally true um, about increasing their productivity. It's more about fitness. And if that does lead to increased fitness, then cool. But anyway, it's just kind of a, a sentence that's all over the place. So the answer is C here. Um, and just make sure that you've got that, uh, that table filled out uh, as best you can. Um, we did go through, like, you can just replay the video and we, it will go through all of those um, throughout the, the, the actual video lecture that we did the last time. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you like the blah, blah, blah theory and then Smith is going to tell you the cool stories about how all of that goes into um, kind of plays out in an ecological as well as an evolutionary context. Right? In one example. In one example? Okay, good. Um, so, ranges of tolerance and acclimation or acclimatization. And this just simply refers to, um, you know, the, the kind of the fundamental niche of an organism with respect to abiotic conditions, right? So the range of tolerance, the range in which um, an organism can survive uh, and thrive um, in order to meet sort of its daily needs. And so we talk about it in terms of temperature, but understand that temperature is just kind of a proxy variable for all of the other variables too. We're just using it as an example, right? But we can talk about moisture. Um, we can talk about, um, you know, all sorts of other things, oxygen, pH, you know, all of those things. We all have ranges of tolerance. Uh, and some organisms have very narrow ranges, um, and some have very broad ranges, right, in which they can they can live. Okay, um, and we can study the ranges of tolerance uh, in a bunch of different ways. There's kind of like the 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 hundred dollar answer and the ten thousand dollar answer. And there's sort of multi ways of approaching the problem to understand the different ranges of tolerance. Um, the two vocabulary words um, that uh, we'll introduce to you are acclimatization and acclimation. And they basically speak to the same concept, uh, except for, for some reason, and this I don't know why they do this, it's kind of dumb. Um, it depends on where you are at the time of measuring it. So acclimatization um, is a concept that uh, we use to talk about sort of things that are in the wild and their natural environments. Um, and acclimation um, is uh, a mechanism or a concept that we use when we talk about um, in the lab, sort of under laboratory conditions, uh, when we study it over, over time in the lab. And, and for some reason, that distinction is important, which I think is kind of ridiculous. But, but yeah, I guess, I guess some people, you know, find it useful. I don't. Anyway, um, yes. So... Um, one of the ways that we could, for example, if we were interested in learning about the range of tolerance of, say, a goldfish, um, is we could run an experiment in the lab um, to study certain physiological processes of a goldfish at different temperatures, right? Um, what we could do is we could acclimate or, yeah, acclimate the goldfish, uh, different individuals to different temperatures and then study their uh, physiological responses um, as we change the temperature afterwards, for example. So here's a study um, that describes exactly that kind of scenario where um, the, there were two batches of goldfish. Some goldfish, the first batch, are the cold acclimated fish. That is, the fish were held in, would you mind closing? But yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. So um, fish were held in a tank where the water 
was cold. And then another tank of fish uh, were held in a tank where the water was much warmer. Uh, and then they took these little fish and they looked, they put them through this little sort of like treadmill for fish. So it's water passing, not, not an actual treadmill, um, but like a swimming mill for, for fish to measure um, uh, their swimming speed. Um, and uh, they did it at different temperatures, the same sort of range of temperatures for the fish. And so to interpret this, what we can do is we can look at the cold acclimated fish. So they were acclimated to say two or three or four degrees Celsius, and then the warm acclimated fish about 28 or 29 degrees Celsius. Um, and the cold acclimated fish kind of reach their peak performance and swimming speed very quickly and at a much lower temperature than the ones that are warm acclimated over here. Um, in fact, their swimming speed was pretty lethargic um, until they reached the temperature at which they had originally been acclimated. And then as, um, as the temperature was increased, it dropped off quite considerably. And the pattern in the cold acclimated fish is really quite different, um, that they were cold acclimated um, and performance kind of stayed more or less the same uh, throughout, the entire, um, throughout the entire experiment at different temperatures, which is kind of neat. But it certainly does suggest then that individual fish can be acclimated uh, to different ranges of tolerance. Um, just like then species also have different ranges of tolerance where like there's no way that a fish is going to be able to survive freezing temperatures because it'll freeze um, all the way up until it boils, right? That's its range of tolerance. Um, but then you can change those ranges in individuals through the process of acclimatization or acclimation. The, the concept that you might want to kind of bring back into your mind as we talk about this was the one that we mentioned the last time we were all together in class um, related to how you feel and what you wear um, in the fall as it starts to get colder versus what you wear in the spring as it starts to get warmer. Um, the same temperatures, perhaps like 12 to 15 degrees Celsius um, in, the, in the fall will probably cause you to put on a jacket um, and start wearing sort of, you know, warmer clothes, whereas in the spring, 12 to 15 degrees Celsius um, will cause you maybe, some of you, um, I don't support this, but to wear shorts in that temperature, <laughs> it's still cold, um, but yeah. Um, so just the way that you feel about it has to do with the fact that your body has acclimatized uh, to either the warm temperature um, in the fall or to the colder temperature in the winter and your perception is different your kind of set point for when you start to wear clothing more clothing or less clothing right okay so on the species level then um, we see a very similar type of concept here where here what they're looking at is the heart rate of these two different species of fish uh, over different temperatures uh, one of them is a cold adapted fish. So this is an Antarctic fish. Um, and this one is a temperate fish. So something that's a lot farther north than the Antarctic fish. And you can see that this fish has a heartbeat um, for pretty much, you know, the whole range of temperatures from zero to 40 degrees Celsius. It's got a heartbeat, which means it's alive, right? Okay. Here, which is good, which is if you're good. A fish. <laughs> but here, this fish, um, you know, it's got a heartbeat from pretty darn cold temperatures to like 12 degrees Celsius, and then it doesn't have a heartbeat after that because uh, it's dead. So <laughs> each species has this range of tolerance. And then when you compare it to individuals, they also, within that larger range of tolerance, have ranges of tolerance depending upon where, where they've been acclimatized to. Okay? Good? That's really all that I have to say about the theory. Um, there may be some true-false questions about this. Um, I think I've been writing true. a lot of... Yeah, but most of them will be true. If you don't know, just go with true. Um, <laughs> 
because it's really hard to write false statements. There are a couple, though. Oh, I don't know. I think there's some examples of false statements being promulgated south of the border. Oh, yeah. we could use but Trump statements. We, we ought not to get into that. No. Okay. Because it will make us angry. Now it's up to Smith for the rest of the class, and uh, you'll hear from me next time. Oh, you'll hear from me interrupting him, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So I've been busy in the background making coffee. Thank you. Um, he makes really good coffee. Oh. Yeah. If you have a stovetop espresso maker uh, and yeah. you didn't, you can actually see this is uh, <laughs> Belinda in the background. She's an important part of our household. She's a stovetop espresso maker that espresso maker that doesn't need a stove. Amazing. So I'm going to uh, play that again. This is an important place to me. Uh, I've taken you here this year in a video that some of you have watched that played before lecture back in what feels like forever ago, but it was only about 70 days ago in January. This is a cloud forest. Uh, this is actually a rainforest on the way up to cloud forest. The cloud forest starts in here in Costa Rica, in northwestern Costa Rica, in the area de conservación Guanacaste, uh, which is a magical place that I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. I'm going to link it. We're going to tell you some stories about the work that uh, my students and I do when we're lucky enough to be there and work with the people of Costa Rica there, and then also link it to the overarching theme of this term, which is basically adaptations, Arctic adaptations. And I'm going to do that by making the statement that high latitude or polar adaptations are also very analogous to high elevation adaptations. Uh, and one of the there's some differences, but they're they're pretty much a, a, some analogous kinds of situations. And most of Dr. Jacobs, when you hear her talk, she works with polar animals who have backbones, and I work with tropical animals that tend not to have backbones. I also know that people who listen to my talks about animals without backbones always wish that there were backbones. So keep your eyes peeled. There will be at least one taper in this little spiel. So. Back in January, at the end of January, start of February, I, this is where I was, um, and I'm going to, some of you, I think about 30 of you watched this, so well done you. I'm going to start out with this. I drank my coffee. Can you turn off the volume? There is nothing being said. All the ants are whispering. What is he doing? It was the guy with the camera. Okay, wrong video. <laughs> so this will be interesting because this is not updated. So we'll see which version I'm presenting here. Mm. So in uh, the upper left-hand corner, you can see a little strip uh, map of Central America with Costa Rica. And then there's a circle around the upper north-hand corner, which is the area de conservación Guanacaste, which is this shape. This is a patchwork of areas that uh, Costa Ricans and philanthropic organizations have purchased back. Uh, it contains primary forest, primary dry forest, tropical dry forest, which is incredibly rare uh, because it tended to be at low elevations and flat. And so as agriculture moved into the neotropics, it was the area that was cut down immediately. Tropical rainforest at mid elevations and then tropical cloud forest at high elevations. And you can see in the map at the bottom, so there's a little ticking of, of the acquisition of these lands. This kind of shape, this strange shape in the middle of the circle is an area about the size of the GTA, which I'm imagining many of you are sitting in. Um, we're only about 70 kilometers away, say, from Pearson uh, as we sit here in Guelph. So GTA adjacent. This area, about the size of the GTA, we estimate contains 3% of the diversity of the world which is kind of makes my, I'd say it makes my hair stand up, but then I could show you the shine, uh, it would have. Um, in the bottom, you're seeing kind of the four principal uh, biomes that occur in this park. There's a large protected, protected marine area, there's the dry forest in yellow, the rainforest in green, and then the cloud forest at the tops of the neotropical stratovolcanoes. These are extinct and almost extinct, somewhat dozy volcanoes along the western Cordillera. Here's a view as if I kind of inflated it. Um, well done the translate to not try and do. Um, so you can see we're kind of zooming in. This is what you actually see if you fly into the Liberia International Airport, the tops of these volcanoes. And 
One of the reasons that I get very excited about working here is because in this area that's smaller than the GTA, smaller than Toronto, there are environmental conditions that mirror if I was to set up an experiment that ran from New Orleans to uh, Detroit. So across, or from Guelph to Churchill, an, an enormous gradient of temperature and precipitation, but in an in a absolute tiny area. And one of the reasons that the work that we do there is exciting to me is because climate change, we've talked about it as isotherms, as lines of kind of similar temperature kind of are marching north and how will um, changes in ice conditions associated with that warming uh, temperature affect uh, populations of polar bears or uh, arctic hares, these kinds of adaptations across hundreds and thousands of kilometers and hundreds of thousands of square hectares across the north. What's happening here is on a really small scale, literally the tops of these tiny volcanoes. So as the temperature is rising, we're seeing temperatures increase and the temperatures in the low elevations kind of march up slope. And with the animals and the plants that live there, there's kind of three things that can happen. I suppose four is the unlikely that nothing happens. It's very unlikely, so I haven't written it down. The first thing that could happen is that the animals that lived in the top, in the cold, wet forest at the top, they're going to go extinct. So there'll be range, contraction, or extinction. Animals in the middle might be able to kind of move their way up slope and slowly track the temperatures uh, up slope. Animals that are already in the hot, dry conditions generally can't deal with things that are hotter and drier. And there you can see um, my this morning's animation of colored ant populations disappearing at the top, disappearing at the bottom, and kind of marching their way. Oh, look at that, marching their way up slope. Yeah, put your right hand up, pat yourself on the top of the head. There we go. Now, some of the cool things that we get to do when we're there. Uh, I take illegible field notes. I am a left-handed person, a left-handed red-headed person. So grateful that I was not born in the Middle Ages. He's a witch! Uh, and what that means today is it's very hard for people to read my field notes, including me. Um, and so one of the things that I've adopted for the past decade is to take these high-resolution panoramic photographs, or gigapans. You've seen them. Uh, in the inquiry case. This is what they look like when you're not in the dairy bush. This is a cloud forest at the top of a vol cacao volcano. Um, I'm going to do something ill-advised and take us there right now. Ill-advised only if it doesn't work. Now, so in the middle of the screen, you can see a caterpillar. Everybody say, oh. How oh, cute. Try again. Oh. <laughs> now that is in there. So this is one example of that, that gigapen, which I'm basically taking to record the species, the large species of plant that are in the forest, but also uh, that also capture the diversity of little things that are there while we're there. I love this photograph. Well, it's in our family room. It is. That's true. Yeah. In, po in giant, it's yeah. the entire wall of our family room downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Nerd alert. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay. Now, what's see. really cute is when our kids run by it, they look at it and they go, "That's the forêt de Papa." So we speak French at home. Yeah. Um, so that's Papa's forest. <laughs> oh boy. Where are we going? I don't know. Ah. Uh, join us here as Smith <laughs> walks up. <laughs> Good. Da 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 do de 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 do what'll I do? Oh this is this the is part. a good one. So the other thing, so there's high resolution kind of panoramic photographs that are taken. There are also uh, camera traps that I have set up. Yay! And this particular one is of a tapir that, <laughs> that doesn't like <laughs> the infrared of the, uh, uh, again. of the camera. <laughs> it makes our youngest son giggle to watch this again and again. There's actually arthropods in this photograph. If you look in the bottom right hand corner here. There's a giant pig hitting a camera. Who's going to look at the it's invertebrates? Not a, it's not a pig. It's the cousin of a rhinoceros. This is the largest <laughs> animal in these tropical forests. For scale, um, this little barrel that's on the back here, that's at about 
here. So say five-ish feet up, I guess less than five feet um, off the ground. And so that animal's like the size of a heifer cow, say. Um, one, and so, as I said, one of the things that we're interested in understanding, preparing for, potentially combating, is the effect of tropical, of climate change. And so this is that tree that you saw at the start. It should be covered in cloud, embedded in mist, and it's not. And it's slowly dying because of that. Now, here's my argument as to why this is uh, analogous to kind of temperate or northern environments. On the right-hand side, you see a, a mountain, say, in the Rockies. And on the x-axis, there's uh, some, I'm going to unpack this because it takes a second to look at, is time from January to December. And so, you go, so the temperature of that elevation, top to bottom on the graph, is shown in a color. So you can see in the middle of the temperate summer in the Rockies, it's hot, and that hot extends upslope. And you can see the bars, those indicate the ranges of species that would live across that mountain. And what I'd like you to notice is that there's largely large range sizes here. And that's, you'll see in contrast to what happens in the tropics. As you march across from January to December, on average, the temperatures are much more stable. And they're much more stable uh, through time, and then also from top to bottom of the mountain. And that's through ecological time, like this year, last year, but it's also through evolutionary time. And what the result of that is, is that in the tropics, we tend to see much smaller range sizes across a similarly sized mountain, and because of that, much more diversity. And this is one of the principal differences. So high elevation is like high uh, latitude or polar things, except that high elevation things, there's a lot of diversity packed into those tiny little tops, these little sky islands. Now, this is a thing we know we know, and scientists who ought to know that tell us that it must be so, so never, ever, ever doubt what nobody is sure about. Um, we can put that poem on the quiz, on a quiz or on the exam. What does um, it mean? No, that would be a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the thing we know we know, but most mountaintops in the tropics don't actually have data. We have inferred data. And so one of the things that we've been doing here with, with students in the lab is kind of setting up a transect of temperatures across, of, temp, of thermometers basically, that record temperature every 15 minutes across two of these volcanoes in Costa Rica. This has been going on for almost a decade now. There's about two to three million data points, which is a hard thing for me to convince you how to visualize. And so what I've stumbled across is this thing called a warming strike. And you've probably seen these with regard to climate change for an area. You can go online and say, I'm in Toronto, and you can look at from uh, the 1920s or the 1800s up to now. And in a yearly sense, the red temperatures kind of march out here on the right-hand side of a, of a warming strike, indicating or illustrating uh, the increase in the average temperature. What you're looking at here Every little vertical stripe is a day, and the color of that bar for that day is the, is the maximum temperature achieved. So this is a low elevation site, so you can see that the temperature does kind of oscillate through time. So we've got 2014 to 15, 16 to 17, blah, 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 multiple years. So there's a dry season that's hot and a rainy season that's cooler, dry season that's hot, rainy season cooler. You can see that. Is it fair to say that... If the rainy season in 2015 wasn't as cold as the rainy season in 2014. You were such a keen well, I just, just want to like, yes. yeah, so, help you to interpret. So yeah. take a look at this. Um, we're going to look at this more closely in a second. But if you remember um, your global climate events of 2015 and 16, that was an El Nino year. And so what you're looking at here is a year when that, if this is an accordion of kind of hot to cold temperatures that march across uh, the landscape, in 2015 and 16, there was no release. There was very little cold or cooler part of the year. Um, and this is uh, a snapshot of a, of a climatic event, a regular predictable one in the El Nino. But it's a, it's a look into the future in terms of what climate change is going to look like. And where, was 2017 a La Nina year? Uh, no, no? That, that's kind of more of a normal year. It was just cold. Ish, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. 2017 was a normal year, but all of the other ones were warmer. A little bit hotter. Than, okay. Yeah. yeah. So now, so that's a look at a trap and then a couple of these thermometers and rain gauges. 
And now, so the stripe that you just looked at is the very bottom layer, and I've layered these up so as you march up the mountain, that's kind of the left-hand side of the graph, different elevations. And this is helping for me, I think this is a way of looking at, say, 3 million data points of days, maximum temperature achieved across eight uh, different sites that go from sea level at the bottom into the cloud forest at the top. And you can see that there is quite a bit of change in between any one of these elevations and certainly in between the very bottom and the very top where there's periodic changes, seasonal changes in the dry forest and then in the cloud forest not much changes. The exception to that is in the 2016 year when hot temperatures kind of leaked uphill and that leaking of the temperatures uphill is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen or what is happening with climate change. So what are we interested in there? I'm interested in arthropods that live in the leaf litter, in ants, and in beetles. There's a picture on the bottom left-hand side of a, of a staphylinid, which is a rove beetle uh, that probably you've seen before. As a matter of trivia, if you're ever asked, why would you want to work with beetles? Why would you want to work with arthropods? In this family of beetles, there are more than 60,000 named species. The total diversity might be double that, and even today, at 60,000 plus species, there are more species of this one family of beetle than there are all vertebrates in the world. Like, but right? But none of them are cute and cuddly and fluffy like seabirds. I, I say pshaw. <laughs> pshaw. Pshaw. Now, so the experiment, one of the experiments that we're doing there is to document the diversity. So we capture them and we barcode them because many of these things don't have names. So we need these kind of intermediate DNA barcode proxies. We can talk about that later if anyone has questions. And then I'm interested in their physiological tolerance to heat and how that changes across elevation. And I do that with a really complicated setup that's here in the top right-hand side. <laughs> uh, if any of you know what a sous vide cooker is, if you want to make a delicious piece of meat, you put it in a bag and you boil it slowly, scrumptious. Uh, you can also do physiology experiments with a sous vide cooker because it packs up and travels very, very well. Oh, 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 I just have to inter interrupt you because you'll like this. Um, uh, K. Ruger, the or average, Kruger R, maybe, that's better, says yeah. the average animal is a beetle. Yep. You're not wrong. No, you are right. <laughs> So this video is actually a physiology experiment that took place over 45 minutes that I've compressed into 39 seconds. And so what we're looking at here is our beetles that I've collected from the leaf litter at, in the rainforest in Costa Rica, brought down slope to where I was staying, where my sous vide cooker was, and I'm slowly ramping the temperature, raising it a half a degree Celsius and holding it there for every minute. And then what I'm looking for is a characteristic spasm that the beetle will do or that any arthropod does. And for most of them, it actually just happened. And that indicates that they've passed what's called their critical maximum temperature. And so, so it's a temperature where they're not going to recover from. That's they may their, continue their to move. Of tolerance. Yeah. So you basically, you just joined with me in a, in a physiology experiment for tropical, neotropical beetles. Now in the literature today, if you're interested in, and you go and search that, this experiment has done, been done with one species of staphylinid rove beetle. There's 12 vials there, so we together have just added two order, an order of magnitude of uh, the diversity of staphylinid rove beetle science, how, no, understanding how this most diverse of beetles deals with climate. And here's what it kind of looks like. The species that tend to be found at the low elevations have a high CT max. They can deal with maximum temperatures in a better way than the populations, than the communities of beetles can, as you march from left to right across the graph, to the high elevations. This is a surprise to many people because this is, as we talked about at the start, such a tiny, tiny mountain. The people who analyze these things would say the sentence that is at the top of this. They would say, heat tolerance of terrestrial ectotherms doesn't vary with elevation. This is what the literature tells you when you go and read it right now. To which I say, <laughs> because if you look at, so that original data set is that now in green and the data that we have from this one mountaintop or two mountaintops in Costa Rica is there in red. It does vary quite a bit with elevation. It probably really depends where your mountain is from. You remember that high latitude 
low latitude. So in the low latitudes, in the tropics, where most of the diversity is, most of that diversity will have a range of sensitivities to a changing climate. Most of those high elevation volcanoes or mountains in the tropics are being homogenized, they're being heated up, and they don't have the capacity to deal with it. That's essentially in a nutshell what this um, figure is showing you. I get excited by this figure. It's not actually published yet. None of these are. So you're kind of getting a window into my brain and my brain okay, wait a second. is messy. So if I did this experiment on my field site in the Arctic, yep. I would be supporting what Sunday 2019 is saying. You would probably, yeah. So Jen Sunday is a great uh, professor at McGill. You can go and do a, go visitor, um, take the train when life returns to normal and go and explore some of the great people at McGill. And what she's done here is a meta-analysis that includes a lot of Arctic and polar things. Yeah. And so probably what happens in... There's actually two groups of data that That's she's right. lumped into one. That's right. There's all of the ones that are showing this downward trend and then all of the others which are and more I, northern. I'll even complicate it more. And I'll say most of the data that exists is temperate and polar because that's where most of the scientists live. Right. And so most of the diversity that exists is in the tropics where we have where we don't know when we haven't done these experiments. And so, so so this is hidden an appreciation of this trend is hidden. So could we could we take those data and recolor them yes. based on latitude? If we had more time, yes. And and we have we we're we kind of just sitting yeah. here like we got time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So those kinds of questions, that's the kind of thing, those are research projects that you could work on in the, in the, in the coming years. And by coming years, we mean like next term. Um, think about research projects of people that are around the department, explore their web pages, see what people do and reach out to them. Please don't think that you have to wait until your third or fourth year to reach out to somebody and say, I'm actually really fascinated by these things and I'd like to do research on them. We want you as early as possible to tell you the truth because the more years that we have to work with you, the more years we have to build a relationship and to train you and the more things that you can do, um, yeah. the more amazing stuff that we can do together. And the better you'll make us look. So one of the final things, um, that's some science and it's unpublished science, so that's kind of fun. I, like as a nerd, I think that's kind of fun. As a, if you're not a nerd, well, you're probably not here. <laughs> so I will assume I'm talking to fellow nerds. The air. Hello. Um, and you're looking at a bit of a, some corners here. There's that famous tree. And I was on the radio this summer. No, it was even this fall, wasn't it? Um, Quirks and Quarks on CBC Radio asked for some experiment or some field researchers to talk about things that they had done. Oh, yeah. um, and this is a story that I told. Um, so in working in these high elevation environments, I carry, if you look at the top right hand side, this barrel, if you've done any canoe tripping, this is a canoe, a canoe barrel, a canoe packing barrel. And I use it here in the tropics because it rains all the time and you fall all the time. And so having something that's waterproof and shockproof on your back as your backpack is a great way to work. So I arrive at a site. I unpack this barrel of my equipment, some of the simple stuff you can see there, the gigapans actually in that little blue case. And I march away into the forest. And I do the work that I do, then I come back every couple of hours to change the gear. A smart person, and a person who's well rested and thoughtful, when he or she returns to the barrel, she walks around the circumference of the barrel, at least visually, to see that nothing has made the, the barrel their home in the time that you've been gone. Smith was not well rested. Um, an argument could be made that he's not intelligent. And he walked up on this particular day to the barrel, and grabbed the far side of it and pulled it towards himself. This is what I did. What I did then, time slowed down because what I heard was, and what I saw was a white mouth open and agape and jumping towards me. Uh, this is a viper, a pit viper, that was very irritated that I had just moved, very rudely moved, the cover object that she had chosen to, to shelter under for that day. Um, luckily for me, the straps, the backpack straps of that barrel impeded her and all I got was a scare and then she retracted and then I retracted and then we calmed down together and then I got my camera out and you can see in the center there this picture of her kind of slowly making her way away. 
Um, this is a snake. It's not the biggest. I'm blanking on the English words um, for these two snakes. A fair de lance is the is the largest one. A fair de lance can be as like as tall, like could be six feet long. Uh, that would have been a big problem. This is not a fair de lance. This is kind of in in Spanish. This is a mano a piedra. So it's it's probably three two to three feet long. Super cryptically colored. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful animal, and. Uh, Amazing snakes are amazing things, and vipers are particularly amazing, um, as some of you probably know, with their ability to sense and, and to see heat. I became hotter at that day and probably easier to see. Uh, if you're interested in more of that, and, and you can go and listen to Jay Ingram shake his head at me uh, as, he, as he interviewed me last September talking about this particular thing. Ingram or Bob McDonald? Oh yeah, that's how old I am. You're so old. <laughs> it's different, Bob McDonald, different, different host. host. <laughs> David Suzuki. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yay. There's a little look into some of the applications, ecological, evolutionary, and physiological of the of the study of diversity, and how it's. If you're interested in the Arctic, there's clear and important need to do that. But it, you don't have to be interested in only the Arctic to be interested in how climate change is going to affect the diversity of animals because in fact the greatest diversity of animal animals affected by a changing climate are in the tropics so similar methods you could you could look at this kind of thing awesome yeah thanks for your story that was fun yeah good i hope it was uh fun yeah cool what he didn't mention is what he looks like when he comes back from the field head to toe covered in insect bites. And sometimes he even brings friends with him. So ants come crawling out of his computer. Because they like the heat of my laptop. Uh -huh. so. and, and what is it, those, those things? Oh, the bot flies. I, I was so disappointed. I had a bot fly who laid her eggs in a mosquito bite on my arm. And my little amiga, I called her. And so I was raising this bot fly, waiting for it to, mer to emerge. And then, unfortunately, I don't have a great picture or story about that because my immune system killed her. So I was a little bit disappointed with that. Yeah, they don't like gingers. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there ticks, are no gingers that evolved in the tropics, tick, along with the bot flies. <laughs> ticks, have, ticks have definitely come home embedded in me that I didn't quite uh, extract while I was there. However, I have to say, what Dr. Jacobs is mentioning is true. There are small blood feeding things that will find you. However. If you go and work in Algonquin Park in the spring or in the Arctic in the spring, particularly the subarctic, yeah. you will come back with tens of thousands more bites. Yeah, which is why I don't work there. I work far, far beyond all of the insect lines. Far beyond all sensible things. Really the only reason why I chose to work in these cold places. How so, are eggs laid in a mosquito bite? Is yeah, that the that, question? Yeah. How are eggs laid in the mosquito bite? So a mosquito and, bite. And yeah. do ticks in Costa Rica have Lyme disease? So uh, that's a great question. They probably don't have Lyme disease as we have here, but will they have other kind of endosymbiotic things, disease-carrying things? Yes, 100% for sure. Okay. Do we know what they are? No. Um, eggs in a mosquito bite. Eggs in a mosquito bite. So mosquito bites, primate, scratches. Scratch opens up a little wound, and the fly... Um, this bot fly will find that and lay her eggs in there. The um, bot fly, oh, I wish I had a video prompted for this because in entomologists, people who study insects, when they do get a bot fly, uh, especially with the advent of cell phones, there is just the internet is full of videos of people birthing their bot fly larva. It can be a little grub about that so long. Um, they have recurved spines. Uh, they actually go this way. So if the mouth that connects it to the air is here, the spines point up like this. And that's to prevent you from scratching or trying to pull it out because as soon as you pull it out, the spines embed deeper into your, uh, into your body. So you don't generally pull them out because that can lead to more infection. Just It's not going to really hurt you. It's just kind of feeding on you for a little while. Yeah. We've all got enough food. Look at me. We're all... Yeah, I, no. I've got plenty of food to share. I'm not okay with this. <laughs> I am not okay with this. Um, a friend of mine has become the most famous oh, bot yeah. fly guy. 
um, Dr. Kyle Elliott. Um, we've been working together since 2001 in the high Arctic on seabirds. Um, recent, not recently, a couple of years ago, um, had somebody filming the removal of bot flies from his back uh, because he was in a um, in Belize, tropical, he? he was in Belize for a little while, he got a bunch of bot flies, and then they started to emerge from his body while he was doing field work in the Arctic. Um, not cool, not even slightly cool. No, so, it's amazing. It's not. And it's so disappointing. Those bot flies would have been so, <laughs> like, like, hooray! Oh. oh. And then they emerge in the high Arctic, and they're like, ooh, it's cold. And yeah. then so, act. transplantation experiments, like we talked about. No. Well, <laughs> unsuccessful ones. They were not successful. <laughs> okay. Oh, I have a sad face. Now I like eat insects even less. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm on pro no insects. I'm on that team. That's why I do my work in the high Arctic. The only thing that, that penguins and seabirds sometimes have are fleas, and that can be a little annoying, but otherwise, like... But again, amazing to things about. to study. One of the things about fleas and ticks is that they tend to track their host's phylogeny. You can then do really neat experiments by looking okay. at the physiology and the biology and the phylogeny of the ticks versus the hosts to see if they align. Yeah, yeah. super cool stuff. Oh, I have a... Okay, that's for another time. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for participating. We hope you are safe and well yeah. and connected and uh, yeah. stay all of those things. And if you're not all three of them, uh, get some help to move all three of those into the yes category. And let us know if we can do anything to help. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk to you on Wednesday. Bye.